that gosh i wonder what you're all about all of us are neurodiverse one way or the other on the chalkboard yeah that's horrible <laughs> they can get triggered in a negative way i find a uh, noisy environment extremely intrusive it's not just adding the solutions in the end of the project hi welcome back to deconstructing accessibility today we have two guests joe over here and nandini we're going to be talking about neurodiversity yeah i think i'll ask Nandini, a question first. Sure, could you sure. just uh, could you just tell me like what neurodiversity is? Yeah. So uh, from my understanding, what neurodiversity exactly is that all of us have a different nervous ecosystem. Like uh, all of us are neurodiverse, one way or the other. We're not just looking at someone who has a condition or anything. Even a person who is neurotypical is also neurodiverse. It's basically the difference in how we uh, you know. Uh, learn something how we respond to the environment or go around in our day to day lives how we interpret things comprehend them i mean this term is actually applicable to each and every one of us right. so i mean and of course if we look at it from what uh, literature uh, and research in this domain suggests then we're also looking into individuals who are uh, you know on the autism spectrum or who have adhd or you know any atypicality in their uh, Do you have any examples like how it would affect someone's daily life? Uh yes, I mean uh, even something as basic as OCD. So some people uh, you know uh, prefer uh, certain uh, activities like they have a certain fixed routine. So if they miss something in their routine in the morning because maybe they woke mm. up late or you know any small thing that you're actually which is a part of your day to day routine and you miss it then the whole day whole cycle goes for a six but this is like a very gen- generic example however if we look at someone who has sensory uh, you know disorders then maybe certain you know noise noises can cause distraction to them or even visual distraction can hamper their you know like how they are uh, behaving in that moment how they are responding to even let's say for example a conversation some people are very fragile to touch they can get triggered in a negative way what does it mean being triggered they 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 go into uh, a response that's uh, perhaps um, just to an onlooker might be out of proportion is that right right so an episode is uh, i think more of a uh, like a more uh, ex- extreme kind of a situation but yes if it you know extends for a longer period of time it can be considered as an episode so i think a, a good example of uh, noise related might be some people might be annoyed by the sound of a teaspoon chinking in a cup uh yeah uh, actually this one i i feel i i, I find it very irritating catching sounds are really annoying come on <laughs> catching noise what yeah. about the, the the typical one the, the typical one of the nails on the chalkboard on the chalkboard yeah that's horrible <laughs> come on joe what's yours what's your trigger your noise trigger you have one the um calls to prayer or havans or you know uh, the kind of noise that people would uh, share with us with the whole neighborhood during <laughs> a uh, wedding <laughs> yeah I, it now infuriates me and i don't know that it yeah. is a um like it's because of a sensory thing or because i'm irritated politically like why should i have to listen to this yeah. you know and and i find yeah. um, like i totally relate to what nandini is saying and i think though that it it changes as we um, in different stages of life yes so for example yeah. my daughter has um, always had this revulsion to the sound of people swallowing such that um, or making any kind of noise yes. with the yes. mouths so slurping tea mm-hmm. drove her out of her mind and it got to such a point that she would have to tell her professors in college that she might have to leave the room and so it it would get her so um upset that she just mm. couldn't handle it. she wow. would leave herself down and come back in but mm. now she's a mother and she has a little girl who slurps everything <laughs> it's changed <laughs> now, not only can she now tolerate it in uma but she finds that it's calmed her down in general she's much more tolerant about uh, mm. other things so i think children have a lot of um mm. things that really bother them like the taste of certain things the texture of certain foods mm. and they um they just 
if if you don't make a big thing about it and insist that they try everything, that they eat everything on their plate, they will often just grow out of it. And we find this happening over and over again. But at the time, it's very important to respect it because it it's it, it makes them gag. They can't help it. It's a developmental thing. Their tongues haven't um, got mm. all the taste buds, buds that they are going mm. to have. There are things that to us taste sweet, to them taste sour, because that's just developmental. Mm. And parents have this, mm. uh, this tendency to impose our will on our children because we can. And in, in the process, we often create the problems that then haunt us for the rest of our days. Like the kid who lives upstairs from us, he cannot eat tomatoes and he cannot eat eggplant. Those two things, impossible for him. And his parents made such a fuss about it when he was little that now he's backed into a corner. He can't get out of it. Like he hated it at a time. I bet he doesn't hate it now because he loves pizza. Yeah. And he sneaks it when nobody's looking. And yeah. at the core of um, neurodiversity is the need for respect and that we just mm. have to accept people the way they present themselves. And when we do that, we right. often find that they don't need to be so demanding, so um, uh, like full of themselves. Right. I think for some people, it's more serious than that. Yeah, um, of course. It maybe is. they have. Uh, it's more. It might be more built into the genetics. The, yes, uh, absolutely. The, the being, absolutely. Uh, the physical being. I, yeah. I think one of the things you, you touched on there was as you get older, things change. I'm 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 uh, beginning to suffer from hearing loss, so I find a uh, noisy environment extremely intrusive, in the sense yeah. that it makes it difficult for me to 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 communicate. It makes it difficult for me to hear what other people are saying, and and the other thing I've, I've noticed, I get uh, more and more intolerant of complexity. So um, you know whether it's uh, you know web access or uh, mobile uh, app, you know, and constantly going through layers and layers of security and so on. Um, right. You know, I used to take kind of pride in being able to to deal with quite complex things, but now I find that uh, uh, it becomes an irritation. This is just, you know, we're talking about neurodiversity in a very uh, trivial way, but I think it's very relatable to to people uh, may may never have thought that. Oh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm typical. I don't have any uh, triggers. I don't have any neurodiversity. Uh, uh, aspects of my life, but they might do. They just might not realize it. Yeah. No, I think we all do. I think there's nobody in this world who doesn't mm. have something that without mm. they're going to be very uncomfortable. What I'm hearing is that there's a lot of traits and a lot of people can have uh, neurodiversity. So how do we integrate this into the design aspects in buildings? How do we make it inclusive for everyone? I Complex. think from what I have read and seen and uh, practiced, it's not just adding the solutions in the end of your project. I have, to have to speak as an architect. What I have noticed in a lot of buildings is that first the building design is done and then, you know, ramps are added or lifts for the, uh, you know, specially abled, even for mm. that matter, other groups of people like pregnant women or elderly are added. But that's just, you know, like they're just adding it on but that's not the approach of design that is actually favorable yeah. in this case yeah there, there are passive things that you can do uh you can't start with a noisy building and make it quiet it's very difficult but you can start with a building that's acoustically uh soft and uh, uh absorbent uh so to speak uh and and you can in introduce sound where it's appropriate so this is very important like you say design from the beginning Adding things afterwards, patchwork is, is really, uh, it's not really design, it's kind of haphazard reactiveness. So, yeah, design at the beginning is really important. So, the basics are, I would say, acoustics, coloring, uh, lighting, um, and uh, maybe textures, and uh, also complexity. I just want to have one thing you can say, short, something short, something about, you know, how you support people with neurodiversity? I, I think what yeah. I am, um, the thing that is most important to me is curiosity. And I try now with so many years of experience um, working with 
children in particular with disabilities, I am just fascinated by them. And I think when we meet people that way with a sense of wonder that, gosh, I wonder what you're all about. You know, I'd like to know you. You convey that somehow in your expression, in your um, your demeanor. Yeah. And as a parent of a young person with disability, I remember how different that felt when somebody would reach out to me like that deliberately, see me on the street and smile. Happened very, very rarely. But it was such a wonderful feeling to know that I wasn't yeah. alone. Moimoy wasn't being treated like some kind of a an alien. And I try and do that when I see, especially children, because I, I know how sensitive everybody is at that age. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and you're respectful of everyone around you because respect is key. Please like the video and subscribe and I'll see you next week.